So we have with us um, Marita Diffenbaugh, who's going to share with us from Elevate uh, Academy North in Idaho. And we're super excited to have her. And I know some people have joined, particularly just to hear you, Marita. Because wow, thank awesome. you. Yeah, a lot of schools are really looking at like an expanding population of online and hybrid learners, and they want to like level up their game. So nice. Hopefully, you're going to give us that insight. So I'm going to let you go on camera. I'm going to stop okay. sharing so you can share. I had one slide in here that you gave me. Do you want that one up? Do you want me to share that one? Um, yeah, you could go ahead and put that up. I'm going to actually start my video. Um, I'll show you where I'm, I'm in my car, everyone. Hey, <laughs> Sometimes we multitask. Awesome. <laughs> so thank you for putting that slide up. And as long as I get my good, uh, if you could hear me and see me, I'll just keep the video up if that's all right. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to put myself on mute. We see your video. We see the slide. We hear you. So you're nice. good to go. I'm going to go on mute and take my video off. Thank you. Well, it's nice to uh, see see you all here today. I see there's quite a few people in the chat. I'm looking forward to tuning in um, for more sessions tomorrow with the Learning Council um, event. So thank you all for inviting me to share today. Um, so I'll tell you a little about myself. I um, This is my 22nd year being an educator in the state of Idaho. I was 14 years in the classroom teaching a lot of different grade levels, um, and then I moved into an educational technology role uh, back in 2012, where we I brought a, the idea of cloud-based computing and Google to our um, one of our biggest districts in the state, in Boise. And all that, we had no idea at that time how much we'd be using our technology in uh, 2020. So I'm, I know a lot of people are in that in those shoes, you know, happy that they did some of the infrastructure support early so that they could be supporting kids um, with something we could not foresee. And then I worked over at the State Department and did a study about uh, mastery based education. So really this whole journey I've been on that has brought me to Elevate Academy North, a school that I am getting ready to uh, launch in 2022. In fact, I'm not far from the land that we're looking at building on. Um, it's all about trying to find the, the way to meet all learners, right? We have a, a great education system that meets a lot of our learners, but as an educator, and I'm sure um, at, we all have our stories of those kids that you feel like you just didn't quite serve in the way that you wish you could have. And um, sometimes technology fills the gap for that. And sometimes we need to go deeper and figure out why is it that that um, student is not finding success. And so it's exciting to see all the ways that um, the speakers are talking about looking at uh, how to activate hybrid and online learning in a way that really honors the learner that you're serving. And so throughout this journey, I've also been invited, I was invited last year to write a little bit of my lessons learned in a book that I'm highlighting on this slide, Learner, Finding the True, Good and Beautiful in Education. I bring it up during this conference because um, I really feel like it's something that works. It doesn't matter what venue that you're in. Um, it really helps us focus on what is most important when it comes to um, serving our kids and uh, making sure that we're really being responsive. And so you can see LEARNER is an acronym, and I have it listed here. Now, when I first started doing educational technology, it was all about the experiences. How can we create the best experiences for our kids online? Okay, let's start a chat room. So we called that a back channel. Let's make sure that a back channel is running. And let's make sure that we can see each other and sometimes put our screens up. Let's activate our emojis. What are all the experiences we can do to act, to um, kind of engage the kids along the way? But also ultimately, what are the goals? Experiences are like, what are the lesson plans that we're trying to offer kids? As an online learner myself, I did a lot of my professional development in an online setting. I did, and the way I personally learn is better with people and better with people's faces, better with people's um, interaction. And so when I was doing a lot of work in the ed tech space, it was all about how can we keep conversations going? Um, and even if it's uh, not happening synchronously, you know, how can we do it asynchronously? And so um, that that's kind of where I'm at with that. So uh, can somebody, uh, is anybody else 
do people kind of jump out of this and to show their screens as well? Are we um, doing a back and forth or am I mostly just talking? Just want to make sure I'm getting in the right format for us. Uh, Marita, you're doing fine. I'm watching chat for you. This is Doug, by the way. And Thanks, so Doug. if any questions, you're welcome. Any questions or anything comes in in chat, I'll let you know. Thank you. And anyone who's listening in, please do um, ask questions along the way. I'm just as interested in learning from you all as I get an opportunity to share here today. So um, I will tell you, going back to this idea of how can we do both synchronous and asynchronous learning, I'll share with you something that um, my colleagues and I um, did for EdCamp Idaho uh, 2020. We did it last summer. Worked with a few um, people who've been part of our work, and I think we're on year seven of EdCamp Idaho. And EdCamp Idaho in itself, and EdCamp is all about getting the learners, which are the teachers, the educators, it doesn't matter what hat they're wearing, they could be a principal, a superintendent, a teacher, a paraprofessional, but really asking what are the questions that you're grappling with? What are the, what are the activities that you would like to learn better or um, or what problem are you really so trying to solve? And having the people come and put down those questions and those requests, and that, that's what builds the conference. That's what builds the day of learning. And then really it's about facilitating a conversation. So we do this in person in EdCamp, and we were thinking, how in the world are we going to create an experience online that will honor the EdCamp model, which is all about connecting and all about communicating and sharing resources? And so what we came up with was doing EdCamp like this in a, in a Google Meet style or Zoom, and then um, creating also an asynchronous way for people to watch later. Um, we know a lot of times, especially right now, we were really getting tired of video chats. You just get exhausted, but people still wanted to learn, get a credit, you know, have an opportunity to participate. So we used Flipgrid. And so while we were working live, after every session, everyone went out and had kind of a reflection or a takeaway that they did on a Flipgrid short video. And those were the activities that we asked people to review when they were not watching it during real time, asynchronously, and they were coming in within the couple of months that we had it open. And then they could create a flip grid in response to something that they had just watched. And I thought that would be a really great workflow for a teacher who has sometimes live experiences with kids with them, um, but then a way for kids to just jump in and still interact and have their voice be heard. So um, I'm just going to take a minute. If anyone that's listening has ideas, kind of like if that's triggered any kind of uh, other tool uses that you've done to create um, maybe an asynchronous experience where kids can give their opinions or input, please uh, give those ideas in the chat as we go. I'm just making sure no one's there. The other thing about uh, an online space and, you know, I, here I am, I'm coming into this space online and you are in my world right now. I'm out in work working and you've all paused your work for this experience today. And what's interesting is kind of as a, as a teacher, really figuring out what is okay with you. Are you, are you feeling like it's really great to, that people can still pause their screen? Are you expecting to have a certain amount of screen time open? What are the expectations? And I think that that's another thing that's really important to establish. So everyone kind of knows what a successful, um, you know, online or blended learning experience looks like for, for um, the people that they're working with. And that's helpful too for teachers. So I'm going to run through the acronym now and kind of tell you some stories along the way. Um, I have one of a very dear student who is close to my heart um, because she is my granddaughter. Uh, she started uh, kindergarten this year and because of all things COVID, she is um, her family and her parents decided that it was best for her to start that online. And uh, when my little granddaughter told me about what she loved best about preschool. It was like getting rowdy with my friends and it was um, 
getting to play outside and getting to um, make things and getting to listen to stories, right? Those were all the things that were her memories from her only schooling experience, which at that time was preschool. So you can imagine how she might have felt the first week of school when um, she uh, got into this online space, which was new to her. Um, she's used to kind of having limited screen time. So here she is, computer in front of her, learning this. And uh, it took a week before um, the educators on the other side started calling the kids by name. It was really a lot of procedural that first week. A lot of parents were involved at that time and talking. And, and that is totally what we have to do. We have logistics that we need to deal with. And I noticed that Learning Council did some study to show us that that's top of mind for administrators and that's top of mind for teachers, the logistics of how are we going to guarantee that we're providing education to kids in this online way. So logistics came first, definitely, on the experience that, that my granddaughter had. And then what came next was the relationship. And, the, and since then, it has come. She has connected with her teachers. She even gets to play a bit with her, with her friends online. They, they use the emojis. They use the chat. And it's much more of a, a live, um, fun experience for her in that way. But it really got me thinking about how important it is to start with some other parts and pieces before we jump into logistics. And it connects to some of the things I wrote about in this book. So for the learner acronym, how are we listening to our students? I noticed that um, some of the conversations in this session and other sessions that Learning Council has done, tips on welcoming students. How are they realizing that it matters when they're there? Are you using them, are you using their name? You know, um, Leilani made me feel very welcome today because she's, she called me by name and she asked me, you know, um, how I was doing, you know, what did I need so that I could find success with you all today and have this conversation. Prior to that, I got a call on my phone from Derek who made sure that I was able to log in and so the logistics were being taken care of. So I feel like both of them tag team to do logistics and relationship right from the get go. And I think that as educators, how are we doing that for our students? Even if um, they don't seem to be the younger students that need that as much um, and they'll just get on and do their work, it still really matters to um, know that it, it that um, I'm here really with you and we're having this conversation and, it, and it's, it's making a difference that I'm here. So how do we listen? So um, again, in the chat, if you have any ideas of how are you listening to your kids in whichever venue that you teach or learn in, or how are you coaching your teachers to listen um, in this time? And, you know, I, I follow a lot of amazing educators on Twitter and connect a lot with uh, different, um, different folks around the globe. And I have watched fantastic examples of how people have listened to kids and what they're needing. I've, I've seen, um, a, a lot of play online and some of those kinds of fun things have been captured. And then also let's take listen and remind ourselves that although we're facilitating the learner and, and facilit facilitating the learning, all of us are learners in this process. You know, the students are studying the content and we as providing um, an educational service to our students, we're learning our kids and they are our subject, if you will, for us to study so that we're sure that they can meet success. So listen, that's the first part to think about. And then empower. So uh, helping students find their voice. And so now I'm going to do this empowerment thing. Now, I only have a few people that I can see on my screen right now. I'm going to empower you if you're here to go ahead and put your screen back on and join me in a video way, if you would, um, some of you. And um, I, I would love to um, ask you a question or two if you're comfortable doing that. Does anybody want to jump on a video with me? <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna. I, I'm gonna. I'm gonna do that. Um, I'm Thank gonna also, you. Also, make sure that I'm asking others who are 
um, asking them to unmute and Thank join you. us. I would love it. Just for a little bit, you can go right back off. But since we're talking about empower, so much of um, and listen, they go hand in hand. When you feel like you're listened to or seen, that's that's the first step in empowerment. The other thing to think about in, with the word empower is hope. And uh, we know if if you've been coaching and part of learning and a learner yourself, we know that hope is a prerequisite for learning. And so um, these are all things. Notice how I have experiences down below. We're not even at the tasks and what we're doing online yet. We've listened to the kids. Who are you? Welcome. Um, how would you like to best share today? We've empowered people to try to get their voice out there, to get their face there, to say something in the chat. You know, we, we really try to engage in that way. A lot of people will play games, you know, in an online place, you know, they'll, the old Kahoot, it's still a cool thing to do. You know, there's other fun activities. I, I bet that you probably, those of you listening in, already have some of those go-tos that you used. I mentioned Flipgrid. Flipgrid is a great tool that helps to capture just, you know, a, a learner who's nervous about doing a video like this live could do a short Flipgrid and keep editing it to where it looks just like they want to share it, you know, and so that would that would be a safe way for everyone to feel like they could contribute and probably a really appropriate expectation depending on the age level and what parents would say about that. Um, so those that that kind of empowerment, who are you? Um, what do you need? And um, kind of what are you needing? And then what can you contribute to the group? So we know the biggest thing about feeling empowered is how I have something special to share with somebody else as well. Okay, so now that we've listened, now that we've empowered, we have the next thing to think about and it's analyze. And remember um, earlier I had shared while the students are studying the content, educators are studying the students. This is our, this is our job is to analyze ongoing I remember when we I used to do report cards for my students and nothing would come as a surprise. Teachers, it doesn't come as a surprise. We have these really long report card processes that sometimes we do because for whatever reason we have those workflows or those expectations. But the reality is teachers who are really in, t in tune with their students already know where they are at, what the goals are and where they're trying to take them to the next place. All of this also ties in with some of Dr. John Hattie's work for visible learning. You know, do I understand uh, what it is I'm ask, being asked to do? How will I know I'm finding success? Where do I go for help? You know, all of those things um, really support us with, with uh, analyzing. And also with analyzing, we have a new way to look at um, learning as we have this online space. I was talking with Derek from Learning Council earlier, thinking about time. And let's really analyze what does time feel like on the screen right now versus in person. If we were sitting in a room together, having a conversation for a half an hour, it would probably zoom by, it'd be fast. But online, for whatever reason, 30 minutes feels a lot longer. Maybe it's because we have undivided attention, especially if your face is on the screen. You can't multitask, you know, you have to be here, all present, on. It kind of reminds me of what I used to do with my students when I would teach them something brand new. I'd ask them to flip their chairs around and sit in it backwards or to change their body in some way uh, so that their brain knew, I'm about to learn something new. And my teacher has never said this before. By doing that, that triggers the brain to say, oh, pay attention. Give all of my attention right now. And I never held them there for very long, five minutes maybe, right? And then they'd get back to being able to kind of multitask a bit. That's the difference between focused mode and diffused mode when you do some brain research on that, realizing that with focused mode, it really takes a lot of your brain to zone in and I feel like that's what zoom meetings do like the video chats we're in focused mode we're trying to really receive or we're trying to do a few things we're on we're not um in a relaxed learning state we might be more in a uh, you know focused learning state and so I've watched some teachers jump in 
given activity for five minutes or so, and then just kind of run some music in the background or have a timer go on the screen and kids are working and then they come back in, right? A little bit later, that helps a lot. So some, so thinking about analyze the experience, analyze what the kids are receiving, how they're finding success and how we need to adapt in all the different environments to ensure that movement is still happening for them. So, so Marita, you're saying that in some instances on a Zoom class, you're not necessarily in lecture leadership mode. You're just having the Zoom togetherness while people are working, individual students are working independently, yep. but they're still together because it creates a focus. Yeah. I think that's the first time I've heard that. And that's an interesting point. Yeah. Well, and think all of, think of things outside of school online. Mm -hmm. Our students right now, many of them are experiencing relationships with their grandparents and their extended family members in an online way. And they're taking the phones or the computers right along with them into the play that they're doing at home, right? I've had many tours where I've been running around with my two-year-old grandson as he's down the hallway, right? And, and so that they, they're used to having a screen of their loved ones um, just with them, because that's kind of a thing where we've been in this COVID time, right? That's been some of the kids' only connections with their extended family anyway. And so, and I really feel like our our school has become a bit of that extended family, right? And for some of the kids that haven't had an opportunity to go back to school or go into a blended way, you're really the lifeline for them. And uh, they look forward to seeing you and just yeah. talking to you and being being with you. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, and I know you're going to talk about resources based on your moving through this these, yeah. this acronym. So I know I know I still have um, Paul Richens on from Achieve, and I have I think Jeremy Jackson still on, and also coming up here pretty quickly is Dina Hollander from Scholastic. Nice. Can you talk a little bit about resource selection and what you're using along the way? Because you know the the what you use is really near and dear to the Learning Council's heart, like how you're using it and can you talk a little yes, bit about absolutely so um specifically when you think about the students at to elevate academy and we do have an elevate that's or um happening already in coldwell and then there's a new one coming up here in north idaho but specifically on that um there's already been a culture around what is it that we need to do to make sure that students can find success we have learning plans. Every student has their own learning plan and then they have a place to curate their learning um, like a portfolio, right? And okay. so a lot of that is done through learning management system and, and we're working um, with, a, with a group uh, with a learning management system that's really allowing us to customize for our needs in that way. I think the best way to go shopping for a resource is to uh, go through these first steps listen, what's the problem? What's the need? Empower. Who needs to be part of this? Um, how are you going to provide support to the parents to understand this resource, to the teachers to understand this resource, to the kids to understand this resource? And then uh, what about the administrators? How is this helping them get the data they need to tell the good stories that they need to tell about success in their schools? Yeah. And so really, um, everyone has a part to play. And that goes back to that empower, analyze part. See how they kind of all go together. And those conversations yeah. happen prior to shopping um, for are that. Some, are, are some of the, like, as you approach this, is some of it like, because we've traditionally had teachers look at resources, right? Like it's something augmenting you as a teacher. Are you starting to, in this time, think of it as this thing, this resource is more than a resource. It's actually doing some of the work. Yeah. Like you're looking at it as like, I'm going to blow this thing in. Everybody's going to log in over there for a while um, because that's going to allow me as a teacher to do some other things. Exactly. Are, exactly. Are you, finding you're in that mindset sometimes? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I will rewind back for a minute to when I was launching um, Google for Education into a lot of different schools. And the best thing to do is to study the workflows. What is a workflow? What's a typical communication exchange between teacher and student? What about between student and student? 
-hmm. What data are we needing, absolutely needing to show success, right? These are all questions to be asking yourself and then match it back to the tools. I, I always, I tell a story in, in the book, but I, it, I'll say it real quick because it's, it just, it's so, it was an aha to me as someone who was providing a lot of technical assistance at that time. I was in a room with about 15 teachers sharing about uh, Google Drive, you know, what it is and why you have it. And someone raised their hand and said, why do I need that? I have, I have think through math. Right. So they weren't making the connection. But, and I, so I said, oh, OK, so what are all the tools that you have? And I found out that that particular team had had 12 different, 15 different uh, t tools that were given to them, some for fun, some you have to use. Right. And I had to help them sort the tools. So I even think before you go shopping, look at what you have in the closet right now. What do you have on the cupboards right now? What do you have in your desktop right now? And what? Um, tools could you activate or what's not serving you anymore and it's time to clean the garage and let that resource go i think by going through that process back to what problem are we trying to solve what workflow do we want and i like to always talk to teachers about technology should really be a duplication of yourself what are things in your day that you do all the time that you wish you didn't have to do right? What are the things that fill you up and what drains you? And then you go with what drains you and see, could we automate some of those things that are draining you? For me, a lot of it was um, a lot of the anecdotal notes I was trying to take and curate. And I found a way to help the kids curate their own learning, which really took the pressure off of me to have to take all the notes of everything I saw because they were keeping track of it, either on video chats, like the little flip grids I had mentioned, or um, on a Google Doc, you know? And so I, I think that those are all things. How can kids co-create, co-design with you um, so that you're able to make sure that your resources are serving you? And then not to be afraid to let go of the resources that aren't. Okay, so good. So I think you're gonna try to wrap up the rest of this yep. and I'm gonna be showing a video and then talking with someone else. And then I'm gonna go into motivation if you wanna stay on because there's a, that whole empowerment and analyzing kids, we have like some secret sauce. Oh, well, I'm going to have to review. I'm going to have to watch the video later, but I am going to be on tomorrow off and on to catch things. I'm glad you're doing this asynchronous and synchronous. Thank you for that. I appreciate yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, because a lot of people watch all the videos later. Like, yes. They yes. wanted to make it and then they didn't make it. Yeah, no. no time only so many hours in the day okay yeah. so now we get to the needs you know your kids by the time you've listened empowered analyzed done the garage cleaning together like we talked about you know are there any other needs that you really want to make sure you address and now it's time to roll up the sleeves and start putting those tasks together those assignments those experiences right and you know what you've done all along you've been creating relationships so that's why there's a big golden box around it because you have relationships happening in all parts of this acronym and all the ingredients I talked about as educators we have these as humans humans we have these to offer to each other and so I feel like um, I really want to encourage teachers and principals and superintendents and all the people behind the scenes the infrastructure folks the parents anyone you're doing a good job we're going to be okay we're growing through this we're learning so much and maybe through this process we have really been able to find you know, what is the, what is most important to us. And so um, if I can be a resource to you, you've got some information over here, an email, a t please follow me on Twitter. I'd love to follow you. And, um, and my um, book does have a lot of really specific um, resources and kind of just things to think about from my learning. And I, I hope that that could be helpful to you all. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing, Marina. This is a good sort of quick way to say what am i doing you know yes every day it's almost like a little mantra to go through um, love it. Yeah. yes it was so nice to visit with you and i'll look yeah. forward to learning with you all um as this continues on thank you for this event yeah nice to have you okay thank you all right so dana hollander is on the line and dana i know we're going to share a video we want to introduce everybody to this company because we found they have some of the most advanced stuff in the market 
pretty excited about them. They actually have auto cohorting in their software, which is amazing and thrilling for us to know about. Um, so we're going to share that. Scholastic Literacy Pro is a blended reading solution that provides educators a single tool to monitor student reading activity, comprehension, and progress. With three built-in assessments evaluating students' reading readiness, reading level, and comprehension, Literacy Pro provides real-time data and robust reports to help inform instruction in a meaningful way. Welcome to Literacy Pro. First, you'll identify lowercase letters. For emerging readers, the Scholastic Reading Readiness Assessment determines mastery of foundational skills. It informs teachers about their early learners' reading abilities across alphabet recognition, phonemic awareness, syllabication, blending, and decoding. The results from Scholastic Reading Readiness will help teachers determine which students may need additional support in selecting independent reading books. For students who have already mastered foundational reading, Literacy Pro includes the Scholastic Reading Measure, which provides a valid and reliable Lexile measure. In this adaptive assessment, students are asked to read passages and answer text-based multiple choice questions that show comprehension. Teachers can assign the scholastic reading measure multiple times a year to monitor progress. At the end of the reading measure, students see their lexile, and educators can see a roll-up of all their students' lexiles as well as their growth over time. Literacy Pro also allows teachers to track both guided reading and lexile levels for every student, supporting either instructional approach. Teachers can always use the data provided to confer with students and communicate with families about their child's progress. The final assessment in Literacy Pro are Think More Comprehension Checks. Think Mores are text-based quizzes that students complete after they read any ebook or the thousands of paperback books that have connections within Literacy Pro. Think Mores for Spanish language books are available in Spanish as well. During a Think More quiz, Students are encouraged to return to the text for evidence. They can view their answers and misconceptions immediately and choose to retake the quiz with a different set of questions. Think Mores provide valuable insight into whether students are comprehending what they read and provide detailed data on 10 higher order thinking skills. Teachers can view every single question the student answered along with their misconceptions. Scholastic Literacy Pro's assessments were designed with a student in mind while providing educators essential, authentic data to better inform their daily instruction.